we are with Jim Gork, Jim York. And Jim York is perhaps one of the most well-known scientific concerned with nonlinear dynamics. And I would like to ask him which was your main motivation to study nonlinearity. Well, before I started nonlinear dynamics, I was studying certain areas of, of uh, differential geometry. But then when I got interested in dynamics and I could see, picture, I just picture how things are moving and changing and uh, the whole idea of thinking of change is, seemed to me just like a perfect area to work in. So I really liked it. I could really relate to it. Sometimes systems with time delays, sometimes, you know, multiple derivatives. Very nice uh, idea of change. Okay. Period three implies chaos. What does it represent for you? And what is the origin of the choose of the word chaos? Well, to me, everybody knows what chaos is because everybody's lives are chaotic. What chaos, chaos means is that a very small change at some crucial point can make a huge change in your life. And the same goes through with certain electrical circuits and a wide variety of things. Chaos means that small changes produce big changes. So there have been movies about chaos where, where um, called, one called Closing Doors, where a woman is running to a subway and, and the door closes before she gets there. And then they show you how the, her life evolves. Then they rerun it and she gets into the subway and they show you how her life evolves. And this totally changes her life. There's a movie about called The Wasp, a little movie where um, a fellow is driving along and there's a wasp buzzing around his head in the car and he gets a newspaper while he's driving and he swats at the wasp and he misses and the wasp stings him and he crashes the car. That's the beginning of a downward spiral of his life. And at the end, they start the movie over again, and he swats at the wasp and kills the wasp, and everything is fine. So whether you hit the wasp or miss the wasp, uh, your life may evolve very differently, and that's what chaos is about. We usually look at the mathematical aspects where small changes produce big changes. Okay. Controlling chaos, uh, a very important work. What are the main issues and the main consequences of this work? Well, I should say that this is, um, this is one of our works that had a huge impact, but it had a huge impact for a strange reason. And the reason is that physicists typically never learn about control theory. Now, engineers regularly learn about, about control theory and mathematicians sometimes, but never physicists. And so when we started telling them about how they could use their, their experiments and they could control the chaos by making a small change in, for example, an electric resistance or a small change in a current, and they could determine what was going to happen in their chaotic systems, they liked it. They thought it was a great idea. And so what we did is we told physicists about control theory. Now, what else we did is we told them how they could control their experiments without having a mathematical model of their, of their um, experiment. Because after all, it's hard to have an accurate model of an experiment. So we told them and they could just look at the dynamical system as it's evolving and, and they could they could create a a data set so that uh, they would find periodic orbits for example a periodic orbit that um, 
by small changes in, let's say, a resistance of a circuit, they could constant. They could watch the 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 dynamics of the of the orbit, which is nearly periodic, and by by adjusting the resistance back and forth in a feedback way, they could control the circuit and they could keep it periodic, even though it would be chaotic if they held the resistance constant. Or they could jiggle the resistance a little bit and have it migrate over to a different periodic orbit, and then they would stabilize that one, all without having equations. So that's what control of chaos was about. Um, in your opinion, what is the state of the art in chaos theory? Hmm, what is the state of the art? Well, it is a nature of chaos to surprise. It surprises people. And I never know what direction I'm headed for. I, uh, I hope to make discoveries which surprise me. And as such, I cannot plan how to be surprised. But I talk to people, they talk to me, I get ideas, they get ideas. We work together and we surprise ourselves. And chaos surprises us. So which way chaos is going, it's hard to say. But uh, it tends to be going towards applications. Uh, I am still interested in exploring the basics of, of um, the fundamentals of chaos theory. And again, I don't know which way that'll take us. But one of the ways of doing this is by not looking at lots of numerical examples. And uh, I have a dynamics program that I wrote, which is on my website, uh, that's available. But I use it to explore systems and then find new things uh, that I perhaps didn't expect. And uh, uh, so that's um, very interesting for me. Looking at examples, seeing what's surprising. Of course, you have to have some experience with chaos to know what's surprising. Um, what do you consider that are the main challenge for nonlinear dynamics? The challenge is to surprise. A, I like to find, I like research, uh, not something which works out the details of how something particularly works, but uh, I like to find things which people did not expect were there. For example, we found well, we, we're the first ones to publish on basin boundaries, basins of attraction for physical systems. And uh, we found that, 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 that the studies of uh, uh, mathematics and very abstract complex variable systems applied to physical systems in many ways. And then we later on, we discovered riddled basins and uh, riddled basins are much weirder than regular basins of attraction and uh, they're so weird that people totally didn't expect them to exist and yet all of a sudden here they are and they occur in a lot of cases. So controlling chaos is something that people weren't thinking about and all of a sudden we think about it. We um, So it's thinking about the edges of what is known and looking for systems which are slightly different. For example, continuous systems which have uh, discontinuous derivative. And, uh, and what kind of bifurcations does that kind of system go on to have? Well, we explored that kind of a system. So we continue exploring. Okay. Um, some people claim that nonlinear science is the science of the 21st century. What do you consider this uh, statement? I would say nonlinear dynamics is the 
science of everything because the system has to be awfully special to be linear. So, uh, quantum mechanics behaves somewhat differently. <coughs> but that's because you're dealing with probability waves. And if you look at a chaotic system and you look at probability distributions and how they involve in time, they behave pretty much like <coughs> wave functions do. <coughs> but since pretty much all systems <coughs> um, all systems behave, have, have small changes resulting in big changes. I once asked a, a young lady who was attending a lecture of mine how her parents met. This was, this was in Wisconsin. And she said, well, one time her mother was taking a taxi. She took a taxi and she started talking to the driver and they got along very well and they saw each other again, and they eventually got married, and this young lady was a result. So where would the young lady be if her mother had taken a different taxi? That's what little changes producing big changes is all about. Not just one event, but events over and over again. Sometimes students apply to a college, and they don't get in, and they think their life is destroyed, but they go to a different college. And they have a great time, and they're, and it's perfect for them. So what, what, what chaos theory tells you is that while you have to plan for the future, you must be ready to change your plans. The most successful people are those who are good at plan B. Okay. So uh, talking about this, do you consider that um, this uh, characteristics, the, this feature of chaos, is in a certain way in relationship with the concept of serendipity? Serendipity. Well, serendipity has to do with plan B. You have plan A, and an opportunity comes along. You grab, you grab the opportunity. Serendipity means you, you grab the chance and something new comes along. The fellow who created Amazon is named Jeff Bezos. And he says that, that most uh, regrets are not for having done something, but for having not done it. Regrets are for acts of omission rather than acts of commission. Okay, so um, talking a little bit about you, uh, the film medal, um, what's your feeling concerning this prize? The Fields Medal, well, um, it identifies extremely sharp people, and in a way it's better than the Nobel Prize, in that <clears throat> People in mathematics, once they reach the age of 40, they know they can no longer worry, get, get it, no matter how smart they are. And so they, have, they can stop worrying about it. But you seem to see famous physicists who are worried about whether or not they will get the Nobel Prize. And realistically, most people, there are many people close to being, uh, being deserving of a Nobel Prize then they can give out the Nobel Prize to. Right now they have the problem of, of the LIGO experiment on gravity, who to give the Nobel Prize to. There are many situations where, where um, just how would you feel if uh, you were working in a field and they gave out the uh, Nobel Prize to three of your collaborators and you were the fourth collaborator and they can't give it to four people so you got left off. Wouldn't you feel terrible? Well. Fields medalists don't have to worry about this. They don't give it to, basically, for collaborations. They give it to sharp people. And once you reach 40, you're no longer worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, now we'll, uh, um, we'll switch to some uh, concerns 
related to, to Bolivia and physics in general. Um, talking um, about the specialization, specialization of a department of physics, why do you consider that the, the department of physics should be quite speci specialized and uh, what should be the criteria to choose the main subjects in emergence department of physics such as in Bolivia? Well, as science evolves, um, there become more and more specializations in some sense. And so while 15 years ago you might have a group specializing in general relativity, now you would have a group specializing in the LIGO experiment, which is a subset of gravity. Um, I think that what, what uh, a university in La Paz should do is it should try to be the best university it can be. It should attract the best people it can attract. And that doesn't mean covering the most areas of physics. There are many universities in Latin America, and a student might not, might not go to a particular university. A student should pick uh, uh, um, a university where there is a center of excellence, if it's at all possible. It can, of course, be difficult to go to another country because of the costs involved, but still, I think, I think the university should ask itself, what areas can it make very strong? And each year when it can hire a new faculty member, it should say, who is the best person we can hire? And usually that will be somebody close related to one of the groups. Now that doesn't mean a student of one of the groups. It means uh, a, a good researcher who uh, has an independent view, but can collaborate with the people who are already there. So the, 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 you, you make the best university by having the most collaborative uh, uh, faculty, and the most collaborative faculty are often the students, the, the people who are most interested in, in teaching and working with students, because that's a key aspect. Without that, there's not much point in having a university, right? It's all about the students. Okay, um, what could be the ways to motivate young people in the study of physics in general and in nonlinear dynamics in particular? Well, when I was um, in high school, we could go to the corner store and buy paperback books on science, you know, things that could be read by the general public. And... Uh, uh, and I did so, and for example, there was books on relativity and cosmology and um, many topics, uh, books on biology, and, and so one should aim at getting very inexpensive books uh, out to, uh, to the public. Now, I have a book in nonlinear dynamics, and we chose the publisher, namely Springer, that would give us the cheapest prices for the public. That was our criterion. Uh, and um, they have kept the, the price pretty reasonable, and they have, and they have um, special editions for, uh, for uh, for many countries, probably including Bolivia. Mm -hmm. So um, when one writes a book, uh, you don't make much money. So worrying how much money you're going to make on it is really irrelevant. It's really who are you going to influence? Who can you, who can you inspire? That's what it's, it should be about. And there are also magazines, many magazines. Such, I have, I've read... Um, the magazine Science News since I was in high school. 
and it comes out with articles every two weeks and about all the sciences and some of the articles interesting and some aren't but by but but a student should be trying to find out as much about all kinds of areas physics astronomy uh, biology mathematics finding out areas not by reading very difficult texts but by reading things that are easily accessible to to students okay talking about uh, publication uh, do you consider that it's important to maintain uh, for instance the bolivian journal of physics despite all the difficulties arose and I don't know anything about the Bolivian Journal of yeah, uh, Physics. I can inform you. It's a journal that uh, has around 20 years old. And the, the main goal of the journal is to publish the research of uh, the people who work in the different departments of physics in Bolivia. At the beginning, uh, it worked uh, very well, but now uh, there is... Uh, slight decline because uh, the people who can publish abroad they prefer to, to publish in a, in a international journal and it's why the Bolivian Journal of Physics is a little bit declined now. I think, I think an interesting thing to do would be create websites a website which has a, which is a resource this is a little bit differently but for example suppose you wanted to find out where, what, are the, what kind of papers are people from Bolivian Departments of Physics publishing? And so one could have a list of such uh, papers and perhaps where they are. Many times these papers uh, are freely available if they're in the archive. And uh, you could also have on the website interesting science articles just that is for general general audiences. Oh, here's an article on LIGO and what it's all about and what it's trying to do. And um, here's an article about CRISPR, which is a topic in biology where you can now it's a tremendous breakthrough. You can insert genes and then how about an, uh, popular articles on artificial intelligence where the the, the the word deep is coming up over and over again. So there's deep thought and deep blue. And uh, it means that they have artificial uh, intelligence sets of uh, uh, they have uh, many layers of uh, interacting networks, a network with many layers and this is becoming tremendously important and it's really becoming uh, we, people have become aware of it in the last five years so where are the popular articles that a high school student could read about and if there should there, there could perhaps be a resource which would point them to such articles they are the, you wouldn't have to have the article on the website so you could ask people to say what's your favorite article what's the best article you've read in the past year that would be for the more technical people. Or I read a great book on, uh, on, on how life evolved and how, how comp complex cells evol evolved from bacteria. And there were two kinds of bacteria. And uh, there are what we call bacteria, and there were also archaea. And in some sense, they merged. And the one became a power cell for the other one. And so you, so all of a sudden the cell was able to have an independent power unit and could have many copies of this power unit. And that became the difference. But these complex cells also evolved um, lots of structures. They had nuclei. This, the bacteria did not. Uh, so you had a nucleus of the cell. You had... You have... Um, these power cells, you have sex, you have motility, you've got flexible walls. All these things occur in the complex cells, in pretty much all of the complex cells, and does not occur in the bacteria. So that's 
fascinating book. So uh, our last question. Um, it's also great for the physicist because how energy, how energy powers cells. That's the central theme. Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, finish this little interview. Um, could you give a message to the physicist community in, in Bolivia? My message to the, to the physicists of the future, to the current physicists is don't think too far ahead. Don't try to plan your entire life. Don't say, I'm going to write four papers on some topic. Just explore the topic and find out the most surprising things you can and be ready to change to plan B whenever an opportunity arises. I'd like to show you a little device that I can carry around with me. It's a kind of chaotic machine. Um, it's got a little bit too much friction, but um, you can see, um, so what we actually have here is a pendulum and the pendulum swings from this and from the bottom of the pendulum, there's another pendulum. And so now there are no motors. It's just hopefully low friction. And you can see what happens when you have the interaction of two pendulums. Now that's a pretty simple device. And the goal is to uh, understand that even very simple things can have complicated motion. What we have here are the two pendulums and the blue pendulum and the silver pendulum, which is aluminum. And the lengths of these aren't chosen particularly specially, but you can see here that the pendulum can swing through 360 degrees. This one can sw swing through 360 degrees. And it's capable of doing things like complicated, simple motions. Like this is a periodic motion where the pendulums are swinging in opposite directions. On the other hand, here's another simple motion where they swing in the same direction. But it's also got motions we call chaotic. Is it recording? Oh. So let's uh, so let's start over. So here you see we When they start interacting, two pendulums interact, they get very complicated. And what happens is this is somewhat chaotic. It's basically chaotic in the sense that if you have a very small change in how you start it, the pattern of swings are, is totally different. Now, in fact, it's not chaotic in the sense that it eventually runs out of energy. But for that middle period where it's got this complicated motion, you see you see it swings one way and then it reverses directions and uh, for a while it was just wiggling back and forth and you couldn't tell which way it was going to go and then all of a sudden it starts doing this which is totally bizarre and then it stops doing it and then it swings again so I ask people can you predict when it's going to stop and it's actually pretty hard to predict it partly because it can <laughs> I've got to say, this makes me laugh because it just it does what I don't expect it to do, which is why I like it. Now maybe it's out of energy enough that it won't swing through. But if we were to start it over again, we would have a different pattern. And, and uh, even if we started almost exactly the same way, it would very quickly diverge and have a different kind of behavior. So... This is an example of how small changes produce big changes in a very simple system. The point, of course, is that everything is more complicated in life than this particular little system. 
and then you see how complicated this little system is. When will it stop? Clap when you think it's going to stop. I don't know if it's stopped yet. It looks like it's stopped, but well, now it is stopped. <laughs> so, hope you liked the demonstration. Okay. Thank you.